morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shelley Evans. I'm with the Educational Accountability and Reporting Branch in Schools Cluster. Um, welcome you all to this first in a series of policy, policy leadership seminars at DEWA. And before moving on, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal people, and to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and the region. I also wish to acknowledge and welcome any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. For this inaugural event, we're fortunate to have Professor Mark Evans presenting. Professor Evans is the Director of the Australia and New Zealand School of Government Institute for Government, Governance, sorry, and the Dean of Faculty of Business and Government at the University of Canberra. The work of Professor Evans at the Institute of Governments is largely threefold and involves the provision of strategic training and research support to state and Commonwealth governments, especially the ACT government. The delivery of the Executive Masters of Public Administration program and the delivery of short courses in designing public policies, governance and innovation. The title of today's seminar is What Happens When Citizens Decide, Identifying What Works. During the presentation, Professor Evans will address the key questions of what do we mean by citizen-centric governance and where is best practice to be found? What happens when citizens decide? Are there some emerging policy agendas that are best suited to citizen-centric approaches? And what are the implications of this for public sector leadership and governance? Following the presentation, there will be discussion on the topic and plenty of question time, so we hope you can stay for that. Without further delay then, I wish you to give Professor Evans a warm Dewa welcome. Thank you. Professor. Many thanks, um, Shelley, um, and I'm delighted to be with you all um, this morning. Um, originally, I was envisaging a um, interactive experience, um, but the audience isn't so large here, so you may think that I'm, I'm picking on you <laughs> if, if I keep coming back to you with, with questions. Um, but when we get to those moments in the presentation, um, I'll see how it goes, and if not, we'll just go to a more um, conventional um, presentation format. Um, as Shelley said, um, I'm the director of the ANZOG Institute for Governance. Um, I was only an, um, an interim dean in the business and government faculty in, in Canberra. Uh, my employer is actually the Australian New Zealand School of Government. Um, many of you may already have come across me um, because I teach designing public policies for the executive MPA program in ANZOG, um, of which, of course, we have many DWA participants um, every year. Um, basically, um, the ANZOG Institute for Governance was set up in June 2009 um, to anchor ANZOG's Canberra-based professional development and applied research programs. Um, but over the last year in particular, we've developed um, a core expertise in citizen-centric governance. Um, and this, this includes um, the work that I've been doing um, in international development on citizen-centric governance with, with the World Bank, and also work that I was doing in Europe with the Power Inquiry. Um, but also we've been joined by Lawrence Pratchett, um, who is one of the co-authors of the CLEAR model, uh, which has been used to diagnose the success and failure of public participation schemes across the European Union. Um, we've also now been joined by Jerry Stoker, um, who is the um, a professor of governance at the University of Southampton and was the key advisor to the Blair government on citizen-centric governance, particularly the local government reform process. Um, and he's starting with us in, in March. Um, so in many ways, we believe now that we have um, some of the leading thinkers on citizen-centric governance, not just in Australia, but actually um, internationally. Um, I should also say that um, I was joined last year by your very own Bill Burmester, who worked at DWA for a very long period of time, and tells me lots of war stories about, uh, about the planning process that went into um, designing this building. 
Um, and this is a, is a wonderful facility for, um, for engaging in, in thought leadership. So many thanks for, for inviting me here today. Um, I want to start by the par with the parable of the balloonist, which many of you may be familiar with um, already. So a balloon, is, a balloon loses control in the air, um, and members of the, um, the team in the balloon shout, shout, shout down to an angler um, below, um, where am I? Um, and the angler shouts back, you're 30 meters above the ground in a balloon. And they respond, oh, you must be a researcher. And he says, well, yes, how, how did you know? And the balloonists say, because what you told me is absolutely correct, but com completely useless. And the angler says, oh, you must be a policymaker. And they say, yes, how did you know? And the angler replies, because you don't know where you are, you don't know where you are going, and now you are blaming me. Now, I use that parable um, largely to demonstrate um, a core argument um, in my understanding of citizen-centric governance. And that is that um, what we're talking about here, really, is building strong working relationships with other organizations and people that we often feel uncomfortable developing relationships with, largely because um, bureaucratic and political traditions that emanate from the Westminster model um, are largely based upon a government knows best approach to these things. So if you think about some of the major relationships that are essential to the development of cooperative federalism in Australia, whether we're talking about the relationship between different levels of governance, whether we're talking about the relationship between policymakers and special advisors to ministers, whether we're talking about the relationship between policymakers internal to your organization and implementers, whether we're talking about relationships between your organization and stakeholders, and fundamentally whether we're talking about your relationship with citizens, the development of those relationships are often at odds with the way in which we do things around here. They challenge quite often traditional norms and values. Why? Because essentially developing strong relationships requires the capacity as well as the willingness to share power. And therein lies the fundamental problematic, um, not just in Australian governance, but I would say in advanced liberal democracies per se. Now, my, the lessons that I've learned practically in this area um, emerge from really two sets of experiences that have really shaped my life really quite considerably over the last 10 years. Um, the first is that I, that I worked for probably over 10 years on the co-design and um, ultimately the evaluation of Afghanistan's national solidarity program. Um, very quickly, um, basically after the fall of the Taliban, with the emergence of the Bonn Agreement, um, it was evident um, that Afghanistan needed to, to develop um, a rural development program that raised the legitimacy of what was an imposed government on the people of rural Afghanistan. So there was a need, basically, um, for a state-building project um, that enhanced public faith in the system of government. Um, as you all know, um, there are two areas of institution building that the international community is very keen on. The first is building the capacity of the center, because obviously um, of the importance of, of um, affecting influence over power relations at the center, but also building um, influence in, at, the, at the, um, the rural or local level because again, um, through funding sources, that provides the capacity for um, key international actors to, to bypass the center when necessary and to go directly to the people. Um, we also know as a consequence that other levels of governance tend to get ignored in institution building, particularly regional levels, um, and often actually the formal levels of local government as well because of the preference for using international NGOs. So obviously the matrix of institution building very much um, 
is influenced by where funding will be channeled by the international community and where they view to be their, 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 their um, most important interests. However, um, this is a, a more happy story from that rather cynical um, diagnostic of, of, of post-war reconstruction. Um, because um, a, a genuinely co-designed um, community-driven development program emerged in Afghanistan in 2003 that was designed by key development thinkers, um, Afghan development thinkers. Um, while my organization was brought in um, to provide support to that team, they essentially designed the, what, what became the National Solidarity Program. Um, and this program was rolled out across 24,000 um, villages in Afghanistan. It has had really quite significant development impacts, uh, particularly in terms of um, improvement in the provision of, of clean water. From, from the beginning of the inception of this program, um, about 5% of Afghans in rural Afghanistan had access to clean water. Today, that's gone up to 48%, which is quite a significant um, increase. Uh, there's also been a, a, a significant increase, increase in rural livelihoods as a consequence of new economic development opportunities that have been afforded through the program. Now, the program looks something like this. Basically, um, 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 international um, organizations are brought in to help facilitate direct elections to a community development council. Then those international NGOs, for example, um, UN Habitat or BRAC, the Bangladeshi um, um, organization, have a role basically in working with the community to develop, to develop a, a community plan, right? and then to engage in a priority setting process. Okay. There's a range of certain conditionalities relating to um, equity in terms of male and female members of the Community Development Council. And there's also a whole raft of, of funding criteria relating to particular um, projects that they can, they can bid for. But they decide basically um, what their priorities are. They develop funding bids to the National Solidarity Programme and then they manage, monitor, and evaluate their programs over time. Um, and although um, it would be wrong for me to say that this is a paragon of virtue in terms of, in terms of development, um, I would say that by and large it's been incredibly successful in governance terms, probably less successful in developmental terms because, of course, that takes a lot longer to achieve. But they've managed to achieve a quality of deliberation within their community development councils that I have rarely seen in the West. The length of time they spend considering particular issues, despite the fact that they have limited literacy. The amount of care they, they, they afford to the management of their programs. Now, of course, the driving factor here is the, the factor of hope, okay? Uh, emerging from a context in which they've seen their families and their communities devastated by war over a long, long period of time. And that factor of hope provides a factor of social cohesion that you could argue is often missing in the West because we don't have those life or death issues confronting us on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are our slides, basically, that provide you with an insight into community development councils and their deliberations um, this particular um, slide over, over here, sorry to leave that, um, basically shows that on every single issue there has to be a, a vote. Um, many of these community development councils, um, the women have a separate shura um, because, for religious reasons, um, but they vote first on every issue, and the vote is then taken to the men. Um, there's a whole range of different institutional machinery that's used to offset the mobilization of bias and in a range of inequalities. They don't always succeed, okay, because you actually find that a lot of processes of elite renewal occur. So many of the old warlords are now, you know, accepted local politicians. Um, but hasn't that always been the way? Um, and these are examples of different projects the development of new irrigation technologies to improve the harvest, 
Uh, this provides you with an example of the, the impact of these, these new irrigation technologies that obviously have a huge impact on the material conditions of existence in these communities. Um, basically, there, has, there are village notice boards um, informing um, villagers basically about um, progress that's being made with particular projects. Um, of course, there's a problem with low literacy rates, so therefore individual members of the Community Development Council have to go personally to each um, villager to explain how the, how, um, what process is being made um, on different projects. Okay, I now want to go to um, a country at um, a very different state of development to Afghanistan. Um, and this is um, the United Kingdom. Um, and this is a consultation process um, that I designed uh, with a power inquiry between the 24th and the 25th of March 2007. To give you some quick background to this, um, as, you're, as you all know, um, there was a failed attempt to develop a European constitution. Um, after that failed attempt, um, it became clear even to the Council of Ministers that perhaps they should discuss the issue of the constitution with the European citizenry. Um, so basically, they initiated um, a European citizens' consultation process in which, in three tranches, um, held um, basically in March and um, April 2007, um, representative samples of the publics of each European Union state um, met for two days at a weekend um, to develop answers to four questions about the future of the European Union. And these questions were crafted um, basically by um, a random sample that was drawn from across European publics. Okay. And um, basically, this is an example of what I would call a high-tech high citizens' engagement. Play the video. This is something. so much discussion to people come up with ideas that you may never have thought of. through this process, a number of the participants have said to me, you know, I haven't thought like this for such a long time. And it just shows me, I think it shows me that if you give people some information, you take them through a process, they will engage, they'll use their brains, and they come up with good ideas. This is something that happened. It's, it's a live discussion. I mean, they're putting themselves in there. They're putting their beliefs, they're sharing their beliefs. 
And even though when they even when they disagree, you see that they, they respect in the debate. You see they're really intending to, to be a part of this broader process, which is to build the European Union. This is something that happened. We would like to live in a Europe that cares about energy and environment, where individual citizens and leaders take responsibility in their own lives and where the EU gives global leadership on this issue, that educates its citizens and actively promotes renewable technologies and research. Environmental issues should be at the core curriculum in all countries where energy provision is affordable, sustainable and tailored to local circumstances. Wow. 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 Eventually, people will figure it out. Okay, so there were there's sort of three lessons um, that I've drawn from being involved in two very tr contrasting experiences. Um, the first is that processes of design are critical. How you design processes of engagement are absolutely critical and require significant and careful thought. And actually, I would say, you know, despite the fact that we had the all singing, all dancing, high tech experience in, in that second deliberation, um, the quality of the deliberations in, in rural Afghanistan, in my view, um, were really a lot more focused um, a, lot, a lot more practical for obvious reasons, um, but also there was, there was that passion that underpinned the whole process that, that made it different as well qualitatively. Um, the second one, of course, is the notion that citizens must feel as if they own the process of deliberation, that they're not pawns in a broader game. And of course, that's, um, that's a significant challenge in design terms, uh, which is where, again, the first example, it was much easier um, to, to affect that understanding of the process of deliberation because there were no facilitators directly involved in the process. There was no stage management taking place in front of their eyes. Now, I would say that, and as somebody who's done a lot of, a lot of these types of um, high-tech um, citizens' engagements, um, it is possible to stage manage the whole process towards a particular outcome. Um, I always remember when I, when I did my PhD um, in 1995, and I did it on um, constitutional change in the UK. And one of my case studies was looking at electoral reform. Um, and I was told, you must go and, uh, and interview um, people at the Electoral Reform Society. Um, and I found out that the Electoral Reform Society had existed since 1887, right? And it had been campaigning for electoral reform since that time. Um, and then I, couldn't, I couldn't really understand how did they survive? How, how do you survive for that period? And um, the, the head of the Electoral Reform Society at that time, uh, who was a, a quite famous politician called Alan Beath, said, oh, well, we have our com commercial arm. So well, what does your commercial arm do? Oh, well, we run elections, and we run elections for trade unions. Oh, we, we did the, the Irish elections, for example. Oh, we did the, the Botswana election, and reeled off all, all of these um, examples of elections that they'd managed. And he said, you see, Mark, the reason why I believe in proportional representation is that it's the most difficult form of election to rig um, and we know from our commercial experiences, where you know, organizations come up to us and say, what type of election um, do we, electoral process do we need to get this outcome? And they, they, and, they, and they do that for them. That's how they've survived for that amount of time. So this is the same issue that applies to citizens' engagement. 
What I would say, however, is that um, citizens are smart. They can see right the way through that. You know? um, so again, design issues become very, very important to ensure that you filter out the, the mobilization of bias. Now, there's a central sort of organizing argument to, to what I'm going to present in the rest of this session. And that is, um, and, it's, and obviously it's a, it's a normative argument because it predicates a particular view on public management. Um, there are a lot of people who write today about public value as if it's a, an apolitical um, instrument um, of public management, but it's not. It, it, it is a values-driven approach that predicates a particular understanding and view of the role of public services with the emphasis on the public. Right? Um, and I should say that at the outset. Um, so the argument goes something like this, that public services add value to a society in the same way that private for-profit organizations create value for their shareholders and other stakeholders. Right? So intuitively, that means that public intervention should be circumscribed by the need to create positive social or economic outcomes for the citizenry. Right? Hence the notion of public value. Right? So as you know, at the moment, there's a fascination with things like um, public value tests, public benefit tests, um, social return on investment frameworks, etc. But essentially, when we get down to it, that's what we're talking about here. The notion that the activities of public organizations um, should focus on generating positive social or economic outcomes for the citizenry. Of course, however, the problem is, well, who should define what is and what isn't public value? In a, in a certain reading of representative democracy, what I would call a limited liberal democratic model, the focus is obviously on elected politicians, right? That basically all there is to democracy is voting every two, three, or four years. Um, and then as citizens, we absolve our rights to animal participation, as, um, as Hobbes put it, um, and we empower the, the elected representative to make decisions on our behalf. Now, the problem with that conception of democracy is that, of course, it's based upon the notion of the mandate, i.e. that in elections, citizens are given clear choices that inform their decisions about who they, who they um, support, who they cast their vote for. And as we all know, um, there is uh, usually a very limited semblance between what is in a manifesto and what actually is implemented when in government. Uh, obviously, the classic example in the United Kingdom was, uh, well, I never thought I, when I voted um, New Labour that I was voting for the war in Iraq. Yeah, that was never in the manifesto. <laughs> um, now, of course, you could say that's, that's um, a rather facile illustration, but we know that there are a whole range of different examples of the way in which governments, um, particularly um, the government before this one, um, took quite significant U-turns um, in relation to its manifesto. Um, that if you took right, the notion of the mandate seriously, you would argue that there was a, a problem in terms of the legitimacy of that government, in terms of what was delivered. Anyway, I would argue slightly differently. I would argue that actually there's more to democracy than voting every three, four, or five years. That it involves an ongoing engagement with the citizenry. And we can basically look at the work of John Dewey here. Now, John Dewey is very, very interesting as a political philosopher um, coming from this perspective. He wrote this incredible book, well worth reading even now, called The Public and Its Problems in 1927. And really, Dewey is the founding father of the public value approach. Some people might say, well, what about Aristotle? But, you know, let's leave Aristotle to, to the elite. Um, but he argued that basically it was the moral responsibility of politicians and bureaucrats to call a public into being whenever considering matters of public interest. He argued that the quality of democracy is reflected in the political knowledge of the citizenry, what he called a fully formed public opinion. So by implication, the search for public, public value involves sharing and often delegating power. And of course, this is what makes this whole 
um, project um, extremely challenging because it challenges established political and bureaucratic traditions that are based upon the limited liberal model of representation. Okay, now there's some other dimensions to this argument. Um, the next dimension is what is what Mark Moore calls the importance of the strategic triangle. Um, and this is the dimension of the public value debate that um, public servant, servants find most intriguing because they can see how they can use the triangle um, basically to make sense of their worlds. Okay? Um, and in fact, um, the use of the strategic triangle has almost become the dominant ideology of ANZOG um, teaching today. Um, I, would, I would argue very, very strongly that it's just one of many approaches to public management that should be taken seriously if you're interested in an emancipatory project for the public services. But nonetheless, um, I am sure you're all aware about Mark Moore's strategic triangle. And he focuses on the importance of understanding the mediating relationship between your authorizing environment, right? Those people whose resources, broadly defined, they can be political, they can be in terms of knowledge, they can be in terms of economic resources. Um, those people that influence the nature of the public good that you're delivering. Okay? So that obviously um, relates to politicians, it relates to key stakeholders. So whose resources do you need to deliver? Right? Now, what is interesting about that, when you start to think in those terms, is that it draws you inexorably into a process of almost network mapping, right? identifying those people whose resources may be of use to you in delivering a particular public good. And actually you find, and there's a lot of research that demonstrates this, that um, public managers aren't always good at identifying those people that have resources that are useful to them. Why? Because they tend to go to the usual suspects. Right? They tend to go to people who they've heard can provide the knowledge, or who they've heard can provide the te technical capabilities that they don't have. Um, and this is one area of public service production that needs to, needs to improve particularly as we know we, we're moving more and more into an era of governance in which public goods are delivered increasingly by non-state actors and the development of norms and values to underpin collaborative governance is a significant challenge for public service provision. Okay, so there's the authorising environment, there's the task environment, what you as an organisation have been tasked to do. Right? And obviously that links into how you understand that mandate politically. And then, of course, there are the organizational capabilities that you have within your organization that you can bring to bear on the problems that you're confronting. So the strategic triangle, it's argued, provides a more um, um, comprehensive understanding of both power relations, resources, and technical capacity. Okay? A lot of people argue that really it's a systems approach. Okay? And in many ways it, it is a systems approach. Um, the second concept of the strategic triangle is more to do with um, outcomes. What can we do to add value to this service, project, or program? How can we use the resources out there in civil society, in the third sector, in various other um, types of organization to add value to the services that we're providing. How does this service project or program create public value for our communities? Okay. Now, herein also lies a particular problem with this approach. How do we understand community? How do we define community in terms of the, the services that you're delivering within, within DWA? Um, now, obviously, many people argue, well, you can understand how you could do that at the local level, at the community level, right? working through schools, for example. Um, but what about at our level? What about the Commonwealth level? Who is our community? Who are the people, as far as we're concerned? So again, that um, obviously provides a significant challenge. Then there's the third issue, really, about what do our communities value when they are well-informed about their choices? Okay? 
a lot of people argue, well, actually, the majority of Australian people aren't really interested in politics. They really just want to let us get on with it, right? Now, there's also a lot of counter-evidence that actually says, well, actually, the people of Australia are extremely interested in politics when it's an issue that they feel passionate about, that they are extremely participatory, that Australia has one of the most associative political cultures in the world, but they focus on single issues. They focus on informal processes of participation. Yes, they're not so interested in participating through political parties, right, or through formal avenues of participation. But, you know, in parts of the Murray-Darling Basin where whole communities are, are being destroyed, they still manage to get um, a football team out every weekend. They still manage to cope when services aren't being delivered into their communities. They still manage to um, um, generate funding for particular projects that they care about. Um, so there's a lot of myth about, well, people aren't really bothered. They're not really interested. They are interested. Um, and their energies and resources can be mobilized if they're engaged in the right way. The second concept relates to this notion of the public triangle. So we go from the strategic triangle to the public triangle. And that's how you go about creating public value. And there's three dimensions to this. There's the notion of, of public reason. Um, and this comes from Dewey. It's the notion that it should be a democratic re requirement um, of all publicly elected officials um, to deliberate publicly and explain actions. Right? Because how do you generate a fully formed public opinion if people don't have the capacity to engage in good debate? Right? And interestingly enough, um, politicians hate that, that bit, because they, they can't control it. Okay? And what they can't control, they fear. And yet, actually, citizens like that they like having a row, right? That's the interesting thing about politicians think, oh, we can't have a row over this issue. That's not true. Citizens like to row. They like to have an argument. We all like to have an argument, right? As long, of course, as it leads to an outcome, right? And people feel better even if they've had the row and been ignored. At least they've had the row. At least they've been involved in the process of deliberation. But there remains this real fear about argument, public policy debate. Right? So much so that increasingly public organizations are even reluctant to communicate the, the most simple arguments to the citizenry by fear that they would be misunderstood. And I'm not going to go into examples of this now. You all know what the examples are over the last year and a half of really quite simple arguments that could have been presented to support a particular course of action that were not presented or were presented in such a highly intellectual way that they alienated the public from being informed about the choices that they were making. Then, of course, is the notion of public interest. Identify and communicate actions in the public interest. Now, of course, the problem with the notion of the public interest is that it's, it, it tends to be the preserve of American-style democracies. We're less comfortable with this notion of the public interest uh, in Australia and, and, and the UK right as well, although it's developing much more. Public services um, are the other dimension to this and the importance of driving organization through values and not losing sight of the importance of, importance of the concept of public service. So, it's, it's, so you can develop a public triangle around these issues that it should inform public value creation. The notion of public reason, public interest, and public service. Okay, now all of these things involve challenging administrative culture because essentially public value management is about focusing um, on outcomes, largely outcomes that the public care most about. So the overarching goal is achieving public value that in turn involves creating um, greater effectiveness in tackling the problems that the public care most about. And that stretches from service delivery to systems maintenance. In other words, classic statistic. 
Um, this is taken from the UK, but I'm sure a similar observation can be made in Australia. 64% um, of spending commitments in the UK today have their origins in the 1945 to 1951 Labour government. In other words, um, change is the exception to the rule. Right? Most policy is incrementally delivered over time. Right? So what does that suggest? Well, to me, it suggests that, therefore, good policy requires ongoing negotiation with the citizenry, right? If you want to get the outcomes that you're looking to get. Um, so, therefore, that, that, that argument there. Secondly, that public managers should play an active role in steering networks of deliberation and delivery. That the focus on this role as de deliberating manager has become increasingly important. Individual and public preferences are produced through a process of deliberative reflection over inputs and opportunity costs. No one sector should have a monopoly on public service ethos. The notion of shared values is viewed as crucial to public service provision. And crucially, the emphasis here is on bringing the politics back in, right? and not being afraid of bringing the politics back in. So the emphasis on the role of politics in allocating public goods. So in a sense, you can see here that there are, there are certain ways in which we can use this thinking to inform our understanding of, for example, why this approach has reached a position of such political salience at the moment. Um, later on, I'm going to look at certain methods of public value creation. I've already provided you with two examples, but we're going to look at some other examples and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and then look at the question, well, what does this mean for you? What, what capabilities do you require to take on this new role as public value manager? And how does this link into processes like the Moran Review to create the world's best public service? Okay, so I want now to just play you a clip from Barack Obama. Ever since I became a community organizer on the south side of Chicago 20 years ago, I've believed strongly that citizens should have a say in the way government works and in the policies that have an impact on their communities. That's at the heart of our democracy, and it's at the heart of the way I want this administration to serve the American people. Here at the White House, there's an office that exists as a place where the voices of ordinary Americans can be heard. It's called the Office of the Public Liaison. But I believe this office can and should do more. I want to hear from you, your ideas, your experiences, your stories. That's why we're updating this office, giving it a new mission, and changing the name accordingly to the Office of Public Engagement. The office's director, Tina Chen, along with her team, has done a wonderful job, and I know she looks forward to the work ahead. This office will seek to engage as many Americans as possible in the difficult work of changing this country through meetings and conversations with groups and individuals held in Washington and across the country. We'll hold town halls and other events in person and online through a new web page at whitehouse.gov. I encourage you to visit. This site will have the latest video of visits to the White House, blog posts from our team at the Office of Public Engagement, as well as information about how you can provide your input and get involved. This is, after all, your government. We're also releasing the Citizens Briefing Book, which contains ideas voted on by more than 100,000 Americans who took the time to visit the transition website and share their thoughts. In fact, many of the ideas you offered, from improving light rail transit to modernizing our energy grid to creating a new National Service Corps, have been embraced by my administration. So I look forward to hearing more from you. We face extraordinary challenges as a nation challenges that will require all of us to do our part. And as we begin the difficult work that lies ahead, know that the Office of Public Engagement and this White House will always have a door open to you, the American people. Thanks. So why do you, do you think that um, Barack Obama chose literally his first address as president uh, to emphasize this, 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 this particular project? This is why I'm asking you a question. <laughs> well, it's a valid background, 
Um, I'm just saying it's about his background working on the south side of Chicago. He worked uh, with uh, Project Housing and he rubbed shoulders with people all the time, I think, in that job. Yeah, so it was, it was partly drawing on his, his own formative experiences as, as, as a worker in Chicago, so that's certainly part of it. Or you could argue it was an extension of his political strategy in that he engaged with social media, had such a great response that way, continued that method. Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you, if you look at what Obama um, did in the campaign, I mean, I'm sure many of you are parents of kids the same age as me, but my, my eldest son actually um, you know, spent an inordinate amount of time online um, involved in twittering on different aspects of the, the Obama campaign. Um, and actually, I found out that he actually gave campaign contributions, which was actually illegal. Um, and as you know, there's a case that's going through the Supreme Court at the moment that might well um, create a lot of problems for Obama because it's quite clear that because of that international network that he developed behind his campaign, um, there were some campaign um, contribution issues which I don't think he, was, he consciously exploited, but it, it becomes difficult from an audit perspective. Um, um, yeah, also his predecessor quite explicitly um, said that the elites were his electoral base, and he had no, no shame about saying that. So to an extent, this is a political differentiation. Yeah, absolutely. There, uh, And of course, as part of that, um, the Bush administration was viewed to be, well, was questionably full in terms of its mandate right from the beginning because of the electoral uh, presidential election problems um, and be also because of the, the Iraq issue and various other questions, um, he wanted to distance himself from that type of presidency. And that was very important internationally as well, of course. But what, what else was happening around this time um, that lent him to say, well, look, we have to engage more rather than less with the citizens of the United States? Suggesting like low voter turnouts, is that what you're well, heading? That's another example, yeah. that's another key dimension to the this. Of the global financial, global financial, financial crisis. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Global financial crisis. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, that whole, the, the whole Obama rhetoric was based upon this, this idea of yes, we can. You know, yes, we can confront these global financial problems together, but we can only do it together. So there was a big emphasis on social ownership of the problem of global financial crisis. Okay. Um, now, of course, you could argue that a lot of these issues that we've just gone through there, the problem of legit legitimation, um, problem of, of um, declining faith in the system of government, um, problems in terms of uh, perceptions of delivery failure, which would be another one, um, are clearly not um, problems that are unique to the United States. They're also clearly a problem um, that have been experienced in Australia and the UK as well. Um, and we can see the way in which, at the level of political discourse, um, politicians have used the rhetoric of what I would call deep democratization, in the words that we need to engage more partly as a political ploy to distance themselves from previous um, administrations, but actually some of them are actually starting to read the evidence, right? Because there is a growing literature, both in economics, political science, and in sociology, that says, actually, in times of social crisis, you have to engage more with the citizenry. Why? because public service provision in particular becomes more complex and therefore needs to, needs to emphasize co-production more, right? Now, obviously, one of the most interesting things about what's been happening in the UK over the last two years is that as a consequence of significant cuts, you know, organizational changing cuts, i.e. we can't carry on doing what we've done in the past, the emphasis has been cre increasingly placed on co-production on social ownership approaches, on social contract approaches as well to the delivery of, of public services, and really quite significant result, results are emerging from this process. 
So the notion is citizen-centric governance becomes more important in times of crisis. Um, of course, it's been important in also in terms of addressing issues and perceptions of delivery failure. And at the same time, the new technology-driven discourse has brought more effective engagement methodologies in the easy reaches of public servants. I remember, again, when I was doing a PhD on this issue, um, and we looked at, I looked at issues of political participation and public participation, and the dominant ideology was, well, the problem with, with public participation is it leads to, to overload of demands right, on public organisations. It's very difficult for us to cope with these inputs, right, to make sense of these inputs. It's inefficient. And if you think about the major arguments that have always been made against any type of reform that has extended the role of the citizenry, whether you talk about proportional representation, whether you talk about human rights, right, whether you talk about the devolution of power to regions, right, the argument against always is can't do that, it's inefficient, right? Well, increasingly, we know that we have the technology to do it efficiently. If we wanted to, and I'm not saying that we should do, but if we wanted to, we could have direct referendum very, very cheaply now on almost every single major issue, if we wanted to, if we felt that that was the way, the way forward. So, the, so there, are, there have been changes at the level of political discourse that have led to um, a radical rethink in terms of institutional design. And the argument there comes something like this. Why should, be we, why should we be wedded to institutions that were designed in the 19th and 20th century? Why should we think that that's the way forward in terms of democracy? Why shouldn't we think, be thinking about new ways of engaging, new institutional instruments and mechanisms for engaging more effectively with citizens? Isn't that rational? When the world changes, shouldn't we change as well? So at the field level... Obviously, the notion here is that there's greater potential now for broader ownership of policy problems to help manage rising citizens' expectations. That efficiency gains can be made through targeting identifiable needs. In other words, the you have the capacity to do more with less if you know what people want, because you can shift resources around if you have flexible um, disbursement systems. There's the greater capacity as well through co-production um, and co-design for um, identifying unintended consequences become, before they become um, profound problems. Now, I'm not going to go into this, but um, you can see the way in which a public value movement is being generated behind these, these claims, okay, um, in most Western-style democracies. But even China has now um, developed a, an office of public value, I, sh I, should, I should emphasize. Um, so, of course, in the same way with new public management, you get different practices of public value management. It means different things in different places. Um, in Australia, obviously, it's been associated with attempts to create the, the best public service. Um, and there you have uh, an explicit commitment in Recommendation 2.1 to enable citizens to collaborate with government in policy and service design. But, of course, what does that mean in practice? and what methods are available to realize that aspiration. And essentially, we can, we can situate all engagement methodologies um, on a continuum in which we can identify the scope of public involvement in decision making. And essentially, I would argue that um, traditionally, approaches to citizens' engagement have focused on consultation, the word consultation. Um, normally based upon a top-down government-knows-best approach to policymaking, where consultation has been used either to get feedback on kite flying for a new idea um, or to justify a decision that's already been reached. Okay? As we move towards greater involvement of the citizen, um, you obviously get greater deliberation, um, but also you get instances where citizens are making decisions, for example, about public service provision. Okay? But you can see the way in which you can, you can situate a whole range of instruments, from deliberative polling to public value tests, to the use of citizens' juries, to the use of petitions or the development of deliberative networks, or to 
co-design, genuine co-design of public policies along that continuum of involvement. Okay, now, obviously, we've all come across what I would call spontaneous acts of public value creation. Um, so the case of Abbotsford in Sydney is particularly instructive from this regard. And this is where um, the Parents and Citizens Association sent back a 2.5 million grant for a new school hall on the basis that it did not serve the public interest as they already had a decent facility. Now, it's a spontaneous act of, of public value creation in response to the fiscal stimulus program. Then, of course, there is the increasing use of petition. Um, and uh, the Dutch are, are a wonderful exemplar in terms of the use of petition. Um, in 1991, the city of Amsterdam um, um, introduced um, the capacity for citizens to, to petition um, the city government um, to facilitate major changes in public policy. Um, so basically, this is in 1991, right? Um, citizens had access to an intranet, right? They had passwords, they could petition, and they could do direct referendum through the internet, intranet at that time, right? It's a long, long time ago. Um, and it led to a petition culture, of course, and the most celebrated one is, is uh, the Hague petition against dog excrement on the streets of the Hague, which... Uh, which you should Google that. It's the most fascinating, uh, one of the most fascinating deliberations that you'd ever come across. Um, and of course, at the same time, we've seen the emergence of a whole range of commercial organisations, um, including the organisation that I work with on the European Citizens Consultation, Crystal Interactive. Now, Crystal Interactive is actually an offshoot of America Speaks. America Speaks, the founding mothers and fathers of America's, America Speaks, um, actually designed the Rio Participatory Budget and the Local Agenda 21 Forum as well in Rio. Um, and we've seen the way in which um, a, a technocratic elite has moved from country to country, developing new organizations, new companies. Um, uh, so another example of this is Involve, um, Involve developed out of the, the power inquiry. Um, they've now become um, a national um, advisory service on citizens' engagement, partly funded by the British government. Right? So, of course, we know as well that there's a lot of commercial opportunities on the back of this for, for private sector and third sector organisations. Um, so, of course, you have to be very, very careful who you engage with, so you have a clear understanding, basically, about whether there's any normative bias um, in terms of how they design these things. Um, but you can see that co-decision making models through deliberative polls um, are becoming increasingly um, used throughout Western style democracies. And they tend to be used in terms of strategic planning um, or visioning processes, um, often as a consequence of some sort of um, political crisis, right? Within, within, the, within, the, within a political institution. Um, so, for example, there's been a... Um, uh, or economic crisis, I should say. So, so in, in the UK, at the moment, there have been about 35 strategic planning initiatives um, initiated by local authorities to do priority setting with their citizens on where they should make cuts, for example. Um, Obviously, a uh, large-scale strategic planning um, uh, event was used by the city of Brisbane, uh, basically as part of their new branding exercise. So it could be part of branding a new public service or establishing um, legitimacy for uh, a political institution when compared with, with their predecessor. A lot of focus on participatory budget setting, particularly in health and arts funding, and the use of, of these mechanisms for stabilization. And the key lessons from these initiatives run something like this. It's crucial that they are viewed to be representative. Right? A lot of people would argue the problem with the 2020 approach is that, it, um, that, that Rudd developed was that really it was packed full of elites. It wasn't broadly representative of, 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 um, of anything, really. Um, so the importance of representativeness is, is critical. The avoidance of the mobilization of bias and the role that technology can play in that. 
that expertise presented in these forums should reflect competing values. So if you remember from the, the clip I played at the beginning, you would see people on the stage talking. Well, on every single issue, we would have an expert from right across the political complexion, right and left. You know, so, we re so for example, on the issue of race, we really had people who, who, who believed in repatriation. Right? They were basically given 15 minutes to address the issue, uh, and then they worked with each table for 15 minutes as well. Right? Um, so, and obviously that's challenging, you know, for, for, for politicians in particular to allow that to happen is very, very challenging. However, it worked remarkably well actually within that context. Um, honest and frank debate took place. At this time, it was particularly important to have this uh, debate out in the open um, because, um, because the enlargement issue was creating some really quite strange effects. I don't know if you know this, but um, it was expected when Poland joined the European Union that perhaps up to 20, 25,000 Poles would, would, would emigrate to the UK. 400,000 turned up in a two-month period. Right? Now, I, for one, have no problem with that. I had a problem with the, the weight that put on particular services, the lack of planning to cope with the deluge of demands for, for a range of services. So it was, it, was a, it was a failure of planning for me. It wasn't a failure of, of policy. Um, but that created quite a radicalized political atmosphere, even with those people who traditionally would not be anti-immigration. Right? So it was very, very important to have a public debate on that issue within this forum. And it, and it, and it went very, very well in, in, that, in that case. Um, so facilitation is absolutely crucial. Expert facilitation is crucial. You must have people who know how to manage difficult crowds. So a class, classic, classic example of failure in that regard was, of course, the, the Murray-Darling Basin consultation of last year, which I followed around, actually. I went to every single one. Um, I evaluated the process, the design of the Murray-Darling Basin consultation against a document that was written in 2006 by the, by the, by the, the, the previous organization to the Murray-Darling, which was a best practice guide on community engagement. And there was actually, you can, so it was a useful tool to evaluate what actually happened. And it was, you know, the idea that they could think that they could stand up for an hour and 20 minutes and talk at farmers I mean, I couldn't do that to students for more than 20 minutes, but the idea that they thought they could do that, um, and when anybody tried to ask a question, I should say, no, no, you can't ask a question. We need, we've got another two pe people still who are going to talk at you, it was just absolutely bizarre. Also, they, there was a fundamental thing missing, is at the beginning of those consultations, it wasn't made clear what the purpose of the consultation was, nor was it made clear what the purpose of the document the guide to the Murray-Darling Basin was. So they all thought the guide to the Murray-Darling Basin, as you would, was the guide. When it wasn't, it was supposed to be a consultation document. Well, they never made that clear. So the basis for deliberation was never there, was never there. Um, efficacy is crucial. Formal policy statements, feedback, and regular bulletins on progress post-deliberation is absolutely crucial. Now I'm going to leap very quickly to the issue of co-design, because I think this is becoming increasingly important um, in Australia. So what I've given you so far is, is examples of co-decision making and deliberation. So I'm going to start with a citizen's perspective on this. We're in 2001. Kath Cook is a resident of Batemans Bay. She's a single parent with two daughters. Uh, her partner died of, of drug abuse. Um, and she suffered from um, extreme depression, so much so that she found it difficult to get out of bed in the morning to take her kids to school. But she decided to move to Canberra in 2007 for a new life. Um, a lot of people here say, well, that, you know, that is just completely counterintuitive. Why would you move to Canberra um, if you've got depression? But not me, because I love Canberra. But as we all know, having a go at Canberra is a national pastime. Um, but the reason was, was because a, a program emerged within Canberra that she could take advantage of, um, and she was um, 
she was lucky to come across an extremely um, important person in her life, which was a counsellor. Um, in 2010, she's a resident of Canberra. She's a qualified care assistant. She's studying for two other qualifications. And her eldest daughter in 2010 started at the ANU. Now, what turned her life around was, um, first of all, getting sound advice and support from a, from a, from a welfare professional who referred her to a, a parenting and childcare program, which had the twin aim of providing support for parents under stress and building parenting and childcare skills. And they adopted what was quite a radical philosophy, um, although I should say that whenever we talk about any of these initiatives, you can back, go back historically and find other examples. So often we're talking about new wine in old bottles here, different label, because a lot of this really is a return to old social worker type approaches which um, in the United Kingdom, um, uh, it was said, oh, social work is far too expensive, so Thatcher got rid of them all. Um, and now, of course, they've returned back to co-design and the importance of what are called now key workers or lead workers that are essentially playing the same role in developing strong personal relationships that social workers played a long time ago. The difference now, of course, is that it's supposed to be economically efficient as well, right? Because through those relationships, you can drag people out of a whole range of exclusions that are highly costly to the criminal system, to healthcare, education, whatever. Um, so a little example of this, um, Joseph Browntrees did an assessment of certain cases and they found that on average there were cases of citizens that were costing um, over a million dollars in different type of public service support annually. Right? Um, so there are e efficiency gains, I would argue, from this process. OK, so what, 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 was it, what was it about this program then? Well, basically, they brought the citizens together to scope and define the problem and to identify the change objective. Right? They did this in a cafe. They didn't do this in a formal institution because the women argued, we don't like to go into those institutions because they remind us of all the failures of our past. Why? We don't want to go into schools. We don't want to go into... <laughs> into um, public organisations. We would feel best if we were in a cafe situation where we feel that we can, we can engage properly. They reviewed the range of options to produce the change objective. They chose the option to be pursued. They designed the programme with, with a facilitator and the programme manual, and they monitor, evaluate, and refine that programme over time as new women join the programme. So... This is a classic example of the involvement of citizens from ideas to action, and it has had phenomenal um, development outcomes for participants, uh, particularly when contrasted with the efforts of JSAs. I mean, you're talking, I mean, chalk and cheese here. Okay, so what's at the heart of this type of thinking? And I think this really is the, is the critical message today, really is that design thinking is about understanding the lives of others. It's not about making assumptions of, based upon government knows best. It involves mapping personal stories about citizens' experiences of public services or a public policy problem. And it has three purposes, to explore, to design, and to evaluate. But it's based upon the notion that their views matter most. Why? Because nearly all public services are co-produced with citizens. We cannot do without the citizen experience. Critically as well, this is kind of a critique of systems theory, because it's arguing that actually no citizen experiences the system as a whole, right? Just pathways through the system. And the role of public organisations is to make that journey as positive a one as possible. So that means creating an environment that allows citizens to tell their own stories, it involves active citizenship. They have to engage. But it doesn't necessarily involve, for example, large quantitative data sets and evaluations. This, because you can normally find that most public service involves a relatively small number of journeys. There may be 10, 11, 12 journeys. So what do you do intuitively? You work with exemplars of those journeys to enrich their experience. And through that qualitative process, 
of, and it, this is social capital building. This is what it really means. Developing relationship, developing understandings of people's journeys. Then you can get some really quite incredible outcomes. Okay, but that means, of course, that design is crucial. You'll all know that there's a whole range of different public value practices um, of this type at the moment. Um, in the ACT, there's a program called the Anglicare Home to Work program, for example, for the long-term unemployed, which, which is having incredible, incredible outcomes, um, which I would um, urge you to have a look at if you're interested in this area. Uh, as you know, the Commonwealth Department of Finance are just about to launch a public value test for all programs and projects. Um, so this focus on social return for investment is becoming critical. Obviously, the argument is, well, how do you know unless you engage citizens directly? Yeah, emerges there. Because as we know, um, everything in terms of finance is, uh, you know, what gets measured gets done. We all know that. What gets measured gets done. So obviously, there are significant implications of this approach for measurement. I won't go through these public value tests because I think we're, we're moving towards uh, uh, the Q&A area. Um, but the, the BBC have an interesting public value test approach, um, which I would urge you to have a look at. And that is basically they have a criteria to evaluate any new program that is proposed to them. Um, and the test is really quite interesting in terms of the methodology. Um, what doesn't work about the BBC's public value test is who decides. It's decided by the, the Board of Trustees that, in my view, aren't broadly representative of, of, of the TV um, audience. But nonetheless, the methodology for evaluating and determining public value is very interesting. So finally, in conclusion, what does this all mean for public managers and the capabilities they require to meet their responsibilities? Well, what we're seeing here is images of three dimensions to the public manager. The design manager, the importance of being rational in your approach to deliberation, of being strategic, but of course, the importance of optimizing capabilities, both within your organization, but also outside the organization. Identifying those organizations and individuals that have the resources that you need to deliver public goods and bring them into the process of deliberation. The facilitative manager. Facilitative leadership constitutes a different way of exercising power and influence, where power is not about control, but about giving direction and mobilizing the resources necessary to ensure that the vision is fulfilled. So you'll all be aware of the concept of, of soft power, but the argument runs something like this, that in a complex, fragmented world, the most adaptive form of power is that which enables certain interests to blend their capacities to achieve common purpose, right? So you obviously have to harness the resources that are out there, right, to bring that knowledge to bear on the most intractable public policy problems that we're confronting today. And that's called soft power, or the power to persuade. And then finally, the strategic triangle. Understanding the me and mediating the relationship between your authorizing environment, what you're being asked to do in the task environment, um, and ensuring that you have the organizational capabilities to deliver. And this basically means that we can distinguish five public value principles for citizen centered policymaking. That the role of public organizations at all levels should be circumscribed by the search for public value and a commitment to a public service ethos. The decision centers in governance structures should include a balance of forces, public service panels, political representatives, and technical support. That public managers should be neutral facilitators of public value. That they should use a participatory learning-based approach to the challenge of service delivery. They should integrate a citizen-centric approach into the work plan of their organizations and that communities fundamentally need to be mobilized first before choosing engagement methodologies. And this requires using place-sensitive approaches uh, such as our CLEAR model. And I would say that, wouldn't I? So to end, well, what is the CLEAR tool? Well, basically, it's a diagnostic tool which helps public bodies to identify particular strengths and problems with participation in their sphere of endeavor or in their localities. 
and to consider more comprehensive strategies for enhancing public participation. And it's based upon a very simple acronym of which there is 20 years of research on social inclusion, social capital, social cohesion behind it. So C stands for can participate. Do citizens have the resources, the skills, the knowledge to participate in deliberation on a particular problem? If not, what can you do to bridge the knowledge gap? Do they like to participate? Is this um, an issue that, where they feel a sense of atta attachment? If not, why not? What can you do to bridge the divide? Are they enabled to participate? Do they have the civic infrastructure? Are you holding your engagement event at the right time for them? Right? Are crash facilities being provided to enable um, men or women carers to participate, etc.? Are they asked to participate? As we know, people respond much better if they're invited to participate because it's a process of empowerment. They feel as if their voice matters. And there's a tremendous amount of research that demonstrates that you can get the most difficult people to participate if they are invited in the right way. Um, a research project's going on in the UK at the moment on what is called a nudging, um, where basically um, complainants to eight city authorities, when they made a complaint to a particular department in the city, were basically asked um, after their complaint had been dealt with, would you be interested in being involved in a citizen's jury or a people's panel or other type of engagement activity. 80% said yes. Then they had a problem because they didn't have enough engagement processes for them to be involved in. Um, and finally, responded to when they do, right? And this is the outcomes thing, you know? Um, do they receive feedback on, their, on, 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 on the deliberation that they've been involved in in the future? Are they regularly engaged in the future? Right? The major problem with the European Citizens Consultation is that it got some really rich outcomes and then was completely ignored by the Council of Ministers. Is it surprising, therefore, that the European Union is going, so, going through such a crisis now in times of economic instability? You know, why should they feel a sense of attachment in certain countries to the European Union project. Okay, so to leave you with two quotations. The first quotation is taken from uh, one of my favorite politicians, largely because he's a bit of a maverick, um, Tony Benn. Many of you will be familiar with Tony Benn, particularly interesting because he was a peer of the realm who, who, um, um, who basically um, rejected his peerage to become a member of parliament. Um, but he's been one of the key thinkers on, on um, democratization um, in the UK for a long period of time. In 1991, I worked for an organization called Charter 88, which was set up basically to challenge the British political tradition um, and to affect um, radical constitutional reform in Britain. Um, we held a constitutional convention in 1991, and Tony Benn was one of the key speakers. Um, I should say that by 1997, you, you saw a new Labour government that introduced... Um, a Scottish Parliament, a Wales Assembly, a Northern Irish um, Assembly, a Freedom of Information Act, a Human Rights Act, abolition of hereditary pe peerages, I could go on. So this was quite an influential um, um, reform movement. Hasn't got as far as I would have liked, but nonetheless, in the context of the British political tradition, has been exceptionally radical. He was basically asked by, the, by, by, by somebody from the, from the floor, how do you measure the quality of democratic life um, in Britain today? How would you go about measuring it? And he said, well, look, if you meet any powerful person, ask them the following five questions. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interests do you use it? To whom are you accountable? And how do we get rid of you? And if they can't answer any of those five questions, then you can't live in a genuinely democratic, democratic society. Here for me is, is the kernel of the case for deep democratization or citizens' engagement. Because the fundamental question is, how can we be sure that you exercise your power in the public interest? Yeah. 
And as Amartya Sen, the, the Nobel Prize winner for economics, puts it in his book on freedom, the quality of democratic life is measured as much by how a public reaches a decision as the decision it reaches. Okay, thank you. So any questions? <laughs> I'll kick off. Thank you for that, Mark. I've got a couple of probably ill-defined questions, so um, respond to them as you, you can. The first is the role of the umpire. At some point, someone makes a decision. And one of the challenges of public service is managing the fallout and managing the messiness that comes after. So that's a missing piece in this narrative for me about how, you know, you've got to keep that going. You've got to keep relationships going. You've got to, you know, move people forward continuously. The second sort of stream I have is, what's the role of research in this story as well? If I ask people what do they want, they'll tell me what they want and we could work on a co-design basis. But there's a whole body of knowledge that should also inform those discussions. What's your experience in bringing that into this mix? And I suppose um, the third element to this messiness I feel in my head is, is there any research or, or what's your experience of where are the windows that this works best? To my mind, it's a great concept and I'm you know, very enthused and makes a lot of sense, but is it something that gets applied strategically in public policy processes rather than being a mantra for every opportunity? So I'm sorry, that's a bit of a blurred conversation. Um, Very good of questions. questions. Thank but, uh, you. Um, okay, how do you deal with the messiness? Um, look, I like messiness because <laughs> I think that democracy is messy. Um, obviously, that brings challenges for you folks, right? And it does. Um, but. Um, I, I, I mean, this is an anecdotal thing, but also I've worked on a lot of these uh, processes. Um, I, I just believe that, um, that people do behave uh, much better um, if they feel as if they've had the opportunity um, to, to, to forward their opinion on a particular issue. You know? Largely, you know, there's always going to be a war of ideas, and there's always going to be winners and losers. right? But I do believe that as long as you have a process where people feel that they've had an opportunity to participate, then they tend to behave even better even when they lose. Now, is there lots of research to back up that, that, that anecdotal perception? Um, I've not come across a lot of research that focuses on that issue. All I can say is, um, we had a row yesterday morning, um, and it was, um, we had, um, actually this is going out, isn't it? I have to be very careful with this then, I can't, I can't, I can't see. We, we had um, a, um, 25 people from a key ministry in um, a very high profile post-conflict state, okay? And um, we were discussing um, the role of the United States in influencing the reconstruction process in their ministry um, for the first five years of the Iraqi intervention. Very pl highly politicized issue. But people sat there whose families had been destroyed by this whole thing. You know? um, and very different perspectives on this particular issue. In other words, there were those who, who were arguing um, the problem with this whole perspective is that it's not been a, um, Iraqis haven't, haven't been making choices about their development path, right? Then there's the others who say, well, actually, you know, the problem with that is, is you'll, you'll, get spont you'll get more conflict emerging as a consequence because they will be no, none, none, of, none of the losers from this are going to put down their weapons. They will take up their weapons again, right? Um, then there were the technocrats who were arguing, well, actually, we don't have the technical expertise 
Um, so we need their technical support to help us get the outcomes that we need. Right? So in other words, you had, within, within a, in a ministry, a hugely contested policy arena um, with people from very different religious traditions you know, in, in that room, people with very different professional interests in that room. They said at the end of it, what they loved about what we did is for the first time, they felt that they had the opportunity to have an argument with their colleagues without worrying, right? We did, we did some Chatham House rule stuff at the beginning. We said, look, the rules of the game here are what, what you say in this room stays in this room. Um, we, we basically just need to, because what we were trying to do is this. We, we, we're developing a strategy for um, getting them to identify the obstacles to the ministry of reform, basically. What are the key obstacles? What strategies we, do we need to develop to mitigate the, these, these particular obstacles. So you need to get those tensions out. You need to have a good old row to identify what those obstacles are to move forward. Um, and I'm not joking, maybe you're saying that, well, you would say that because you facilitated this. But they were emancipated by actually saying things that they weren't able to say for five years, you know? So I know it's just anecdotal and everything, but I've seen that happen in many countries in the world. I saw that happen in Sri Lanka. We were brought in to do what's called the three R's process. This was before the, the um, peace, bef well, bef before the so-called peace process recently. Three R's process was supposed to be a bottom-up approach to peace building based upon um, um, reconciliation, rehabilitation, and recovery, okay? So basically there was supposed to be a 24, it was, it was, it was like a, a tour around Sri Lanka, um, holding civic forums to discuss the future of Sri Lanka um, and what was important in terms of the recovery process. Okay? Um, that whole process was kick-started by um, a deliberation um, in the, the Hilton Hotel, um, which had the participation of the Tamil Tigers. Right? So you had Tamil Tigers there sitting along, alongside um, Singhalese public servants um, first of all, talking about blockages to humanitarian assistance, and secondly, talking about new collaborative governance systems that would emerge within a peaceful situation. Right? Then, as you all know, the tsunami came. The tsunami basically blew away the peace process because lots of money came into Sri Lanka, and it inflated the bureaucracy and everybody's living conditions. The elites' living conditions went up again, and they, they were no longer interested in peace. Right? Uh, which is very instructive in many ways. Again, after some difficult, difficult beginnings, I have to say very difficult beginnings, what we did is we organized people into groups. So on every single group, there was, a, there was a representative of the Tamil Tigers in every group. But there were also representatives from international NGOs. In, in a sense, each table reflected the collaborative system of governance. Right? We got them to reflect on the major obstacles that they viewed to programming. What are, the, what are the obstacles to humanitarian programming? So you start with that. Right? And they started to engage in dialogue. A day later, right, we managed to get to the really serious issues, the serious blockages. But because they had developed from technical issues into highly political issues through a process of deliberation, they had developed relationships with the other, right? Um, they'd started to have a good old row, right? But it was closely facilitated. Um, real progress was made at that forum. So where am I going with all this? Where I'm going for all this is that you have to have trust in the process of deliberation. It does take a leap of faith, but that leap of faith is important. People, as Obama says, you know, and I think he's right on this one, people will work it out. They will work it out for themselves. So, uh, okay, that was that one, wasn't it? Sorry, uh, I, got, I got carried away there. I do apologize. Um, so the other, great windows. Great windows for me, right? A great window for me is, we have this thing called a criminal justice system, right? In which we trust people to make decisions on life and death issues. We've had a long tradition of a criminal justice system where we, we trust citizens. You know, 
we will trust you to make this decision to lock this person up or not for the rest of his life. Right? No problem. We can do that. But we don't trust people to say, well, you know, how often do you want your, <laughs> your, um, your bins collected? Or, do you know what I mean? It just seems counterintuitive to me. Um, a lot of work is do, being done at the moment on how you can use existing institutions, because the other problem with Westminster-style Westminster democracies, as you all know, is whenever there's a problem, you create a new institution. You know, integrity is a classic example. There's an integrity crisis. So you create a new integrity agency, right? Normally, without doing anything to the existing institutional playing field, water is a classic example of that. You look at the proliferation of water agencies, new minister comes in, not happy with the progress of reform, creates a new institution. Doesn't do anything with the existing institutions. So you get this institutional layering. God knows how much that costs. Notice you never see any economic costing of that. But it must run into the, to the, you know, into, the, into the millions at the very least. Okay, so the notion here is what institutions matter, right? What are the institutions that people care most about? And they can be within the community or they could be at different levels of governance, you know, or within the... The, the policy community that operates around particular. So what, what are the fully functioning institutions? Where do people feel that they can go, where they can share their ideas, where they can relax, where they can interact, where they can build strong relationships? Use those institutions because people will share their ideas better within those institutions. That could be the club. It's often the club, right? It could be a church in particular, in a particular area, okay? But I argue in particular at the moment that we should be using the criminal justice system because we're putting a lot of money into it. A lot of people go to serve. They have the support of their employer to do it, so it's costing money from their employer. And then suddenly they're not involved in a jury for a variety of reasons. They don't, they don't reach the right you know, criteria, whatever. Some of them go home. Some of them go back to work. There's a lot of research on that. Most of them go home. Um, my argument would be, well, why can't we deploy them in the public interest, because that's what the criminal justice system is about, isn't it? It's about protecting the public interest in terms of prudential security issues. Why can't we deploy them um, um, to act as, in, to be involved in a citizen's jury in different areas of, of, of public policy? Would it cost a lot more money? So that's an example of, of where you can use an existing institution where money is being spent to enrich the deliberative process. I think that's a big window. Um, I think there's a big window, particularly, in my view, in community-driven development in the Northern Territory. Um, what I would say is that there are some creative lessons being drawn now, much more between international development programs, such as the National Solidarity Program, the Chamatan Development Program in Indonesia as well, um, and methodologies of um, co-decision making within, within indigenous communities. I don't understand why there, ha there isn't a standing relationship between um, the key decision-making bodies on indigenous affairs in Australia and organizations like the Department for International Development in the UK or AusAid or BRAC, the great development institutions of the world who have, who have managed to, to achieve remarkable things in, in the most difficult circumstances. Why aren't lessons being drawn across? Why are we taking a Westminster perspective? question mark. So, I, I mean, I, for me, but I'm an apostle, as you can see, there are infinite big windows of opportunity for citizens' engagement. Um, Mark, thank you. You've talked about a number of methods for involving citizens, um, you know, forums, petitions, referenda, online, using various technologies. But I wondered if you could perhaps talk a bit about two that I'm very interested in um, because we've uh, seen and used various examples. So one is ethnography um, and I know that has been used particularly well in South Australia. You might have heard of the Families by Families initiative with the Australian Centre for Social Innovation um, and that's looking at how you know, families are managing and how they're using services. And I think that's also been used in our own department with the family-centred employment program, looking mm -hmm. at uh, a day in the life of, of people in, in those various areas where the, uh, 
program operates. Mm. So that's one example, uh, ethnography. Um, the other example is online consultation. And the example I was thinking of there was um, with the renewal of the education goals for young Australians, That's, that is the Melbourne Declaration. Mm. There was a paper put up on the Ministerial Council website and um, people were invited to comment on the goals. So my question is, have you got any comments about the efficacy um, of various methods, like qualitative methods such as uh, ethnography and also the online approach. How, how effective is it and do you feel that you get uh, representative views? Right. Leading question. Because <laughs> you don't, do you? Not really. That's the problem. With, with, uh, I mean, there must be ways of doing this whereby um, look, I mean, I'll give you an example, that European Citizens Consultation. A condition for each country was that you had to bring in um, an independent organisation org organization like MORI or NOP to develop a representative sample. Um, and the first day that I walked in, I thought, nah, this is not a representative sample. Why? Because they, they sample off the internet now. And um, what they do is, you might have somebody who, who um, has the profile of, I don't know, a C1 or whatever, uh, but actually has much greater knowledge than the C1 because they become professional um, deliberators. There are people, and a large number of people, who make up to an extra two, three hundred dollars filling in online surveys. Yeah? Um, and um, through that whole process of survey filling in, right? their knowledge increases quite significantly on particular issues. And these polling companies are using these people in deliberative forums, because right? they also get paid for these deliberative forums, you see. Um, so each mem participant was paid for the weekend to come down. Yeah? Um, so consequently, you're not, I don't think you are getting that representativeness. In terms of online consultations, the other problem is, um, and there's a, there is a lot of research on this, um, is that people engage um, in online discussions where they feel safe with people like them, yeah? Uh, and that comes up all the time. You know, it's like Facebook as well. You know, you have your friends. You have your friends for a particular reason because you tend... Well, there's some exceptions to the rule. We all have that friend who... You know, is a tiller the hun. <laughs> However, in the main, people go to places on the internet where they feel safe, where they can interact with people like them, right? So you've got a real problem in terms of the representativeness, um, unless you do some proper sampling a priori to to the intervention. So it's very difficult to use it as a spontaneous tool of consultation and get that representativeness. Um, on the eth ethnography, um, yeah, I mean that's obviously very closely linked to design thinking, really. Uh, it is about journey mapping. Um, but also it's about um, thinking about um, um, where people feel safe. Sometimes that is the family. It's not always the family. One in very, very interesting finding that we've, and I suppose this is because we've been making assumptions, um, so I'm doing an evaluation of, of, of a particular program at the moment that has a large number of indigenous participants. Um, and there was an assumption made um, by the program team that these indigenous participants would want to, to live with other indigenous people in a particular area, in a particular scheme. It turned out that we didn't um, because they're, they're trying to manage their, their drug habits and didn't want, and this was a place where it was easier most easy to find drugs, right? But there was a, an assumption made that the, the right network for them would be with, yeah? And also there's an assumption made that the right brokers for them, the right support team would be indigenous NGOs. Well, 95% um, of them didn't want to have the support of indigenous NGOs because, and this is just a perception, not saying this is true, but their perception basically was that uh, there'd be a problem with secrecy, 
that their personal information would be divulged to other members of their community, and they didn't want it. Um, so that's the problem with the, with the program. If it proceeds on two basic assumptions about where people should get support and where they should be housed, and they're erroneous, you've got a problem, haven't you? Um, so we can also make assumptions, basically, that the family unit is the best way to wrap services around people that need them. It is sometimes, but it's not always. Um, as you know, New Zealand are making a lot of ground in this area with the Fanawara program, um, fam, uh, Community Wellbeing Program, as it's called, which is basically about wrapping services around the family, but giving them choice and responsibility um, about the range of services that they can access, so they feel that they have some ownership um, over that. That's also been reflected now in the development of individual budgeting, individual budgets for citizens experiencing particular problems. Um, some countries in the US putting a dollar sign on that, others are just putting a range of services. So they're saying, look, you can access this range of services. It's your choice. Work through your choices with your, with your key worker. However, that's, the, dis that's the, the distinguishing characteristics about these programs are two things. One, the importance of place. But, but place, in the, the importance of place in relation to the citizen and not the program, right? That might be the family. It might be the public housing complex. It might be the club. It might, you know, the place will differ depending on the, the views of the citizen. Um, the second one is the, the key role of the, the, the key worker or the lead worker in developing that trusting relationship. Um, which is absolutely critical to getting the outcomes that, that you need. So um, ethnography is very much part of this, actually, in terms of a research tool. Um, and it seems strange to me saying this because in the past I've made, you know, the National Solidarity Program evaluation was a multi-million dollar thing. I think now I could have done the same thing, you know, with a tenth of the money using ethnographic and um, design thinking just working with people experiencing particular journeys and focusing on, on enriching those journeys. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. So therefore, any, any organization now that says that they can't afford to do evaluation or monitoring properly, I think it's nonsense. You know? There are ways of doing it. Um, you, know, you might need to have more expertise of that type of approach, but it's going to be much cheaper than doing a, a statistically significant quantitative um, evaluation. I don't know if that, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Atkins. Um, Thank you. You've certainly, sorry we don't have time for any further questions, folks, but um, it's wrap up time. Um, I'd like you all to thank Professor Evans for his very, very um, enlightening speech. Um, it certainly will give us a lot to think about in our, in our leadership skills and our jobs um, and some challenges in operating in the current environment. So thank you very much, Professor Evans. Thank you. And um, I'd like you all to thank Professor Evans.